Maggie Gunnis, Alex Miller, Kylie Moore, Layla Scholander. Experts in literacy and child development have discovered that if children know eight nursery rhymes by heart by the time that they are four years old, they are usually among the best readers by the time that they are eight. This is a quote said by Mem Fox, a well-published children's author and a former literacy professor at Flinders University in Australia. When serving, 100% of people in this room have enjoyed laughingly singing nursery rhymes with childhood companions, but we would certainly not be allowed to recite these rhymes if the real meanings behind them were more publicly known. The origins of nursery rhymes are far more gruesome than they, than they are made out to be by society. First, we'll talk about Humpty Dumpty, then Ba Ba Black Sheep, next Jack and Jill, and finally Mary Mary Quite Contrary. So let's begin by looking at the origins of the nursery rhyme Humpty Dumpty. We have all heard the children's nursery rhyme Humpty Dumpty. If not, I will say it now for you from the book, a first picture book of nursery rhymes. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Mark Jones, who has a PhD in Mark Jones, who has a PhD in philosophy, stated in his article written Humpty Dum called Humpty Dumpty, written in 2012, that this nursery rhyme was first printed in the year of 1810 and became famous through Lewis Carroll's book called Alice Through the Looking Glass. Humpty Dumpty was first used in the 15th century to describe larger people. But in the 18th century, Humpty Dumpty was slang for a clumsy person. Many people associated a clumsy person with an egg. In the stories throughout history then, Humpty Dumpty is portrayed as a large round egg. There are many ideas people had to what or whom Humpty Dumpty represented. The first idea being that Humpty Dumpty was a nickname for a cannon used in the town of Colchester during the English Civil War. Colchester was a smaller town that was under attack during this time, but it had a wall surrounding it. There weren't many things in this town, but one thing being a church. The cannon lied on top of the church and was shooting down at the attacking troops. The church got shot at and shot at, and it soon became very unstable. The roof finally collapsed, and the cannon came down with it. And just like Humpty Dumpty couldn't be put back together, the cannon was destroyed in the end and couldn't be placed back on top of the church. Husband and wife, Barry and Joyce Bissell, who collectively have an MD and an MS in child psychology, wrote an article called The Real Meaning of Humpty Dumpty in 2011, which says that another idea is that since Humpty Dumpty was portrayed as an egg, this was symbolizing fertility, creation, but also being fragile. The story states that Humpty Dumpty was sitting on a wall, and that gets related to people sitting on a fence and not being able to decide which way they want to go or where their future lies. The great fall he faces is like people facing their fears and falling into their destinies. Another interpretation could be people falling off the face of the earth, or rather, ending their own life. The not being able to be put back together by all the men can be interpreted in the way of people should not be put back together by earthly things, but rather a higher power. If you interpreted the story in the way of Humpty Dumpty ending his own life, well then that would get interpreted in the way of people just have their life ended there and they can't be put back together because they are dead. And they would either go to a heaven or a hell or whatever you may believe in. Another common idea is that Humpty Dumpty portrayed King Richard II. King Richard sat up on a wall, or rather his high horse. Some people even went as far as saying that the horse's name was Wall. King Richard fell off of this horse and was killed. Hence, he couldn't be put back together. Vicki Raquette, who has a degree in early childhood education, stated in her published art lesson plan in 2015 that Humpty Dumpty can be taught in schools today. Her example would be to build a wall using building blocks. The next step would be to decorate an egg to represent Humpty Dumpty. Each child would do their own. Throughout the week, while working on the eggs and building the wall, have the children start to memorize the rhyme. Then, when 
that it is completely memorized, have the children say it, and push their egg off of the wall they have built, and let them watch it break. Because when the egg is broken, they can learn a lesson. Not all things that are broken can be fixed. They can also learn some things from it. They will get good memorization skills. They can learn that when life doesn't go your way, it will still go on. And they can also learn other facts about Humpty Dumpty. Now that you know the origins of Humpty Dumpty, we will move on to Baba Black Sheep. The nursery rhyme, Baba Black Sheep, was first published in 1744 in the Tommy Thumb's Pink Song Book. If you have not heard of this nursery rhyme, I will now recite it for you from the book Mother Goose. Baba Black Sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. One for the master, one for the dame, and one for the little boy who lives down the lane. According to Ruth Richardson, an independent scholar and professor at Hong Kong University, wrote an article on the Tommy Thumbs Pretty Songbook on February 6, 2014, that stated, The Tommy Thumbs Pretty Songbook is the earliest surviving collection of nursery rhymes. The book includes 39 rhymes, and there's evidence that volumes 1 and 2 were advertised for sale in the early 1700s. No copies of the first volume are still in existence, and only two copies of the second volume have survived. The publisher, Thomas Cooper, is claimed to be a nurse love child, while Mary Cooper, the widow of Mr. Cooper, is said to have sold the book. Baba Black Sheep has many theories of origin. One theory dates back to the early 1300s. It is claimed to be a political satire toward King Edward I. He collected tax from every part of the country. The farmers also paid the tax in wool, one third to the king, the master, one third to the local nobleman, the dame, and the remaining one third went to the farmer himself, who was the little boy in the rhyme. An interesting fact is that the wool of a black sheep was actually worth less than the wool of a white sheep. The wool of a white sheep could be dyed and changed to any color. Wool was also very critical to the economy during this time. The wool trade was given the name, the jewel of the realm, due to its significance in England's wealth. It dominated the English export trade from the late 13th century to its decline in the early 15th century. In over 20 years, wool was the main focus of the establishment of England. It demonstrated political and economic power. By the late 13th century, areas of Europe could not have occurred without the export trade. A stop in the export trade could have caused starvation or even economic ruin. According to Adrian R. Bell, Chris Brooks, and Paul R. Driver, Cambridge University Press authors of the English wool market in 2007 stated the export in raw wool was during the 13th century to the 14th century, with an estimated 45,000 sacks per year, gradually declining to 33,000 in 1355 and only 10,000 in 1476. Wool was a medieval asset whose production, exchange, and manufacture launched countless ships, occupied many merchants, and kept the looms of Flanders, England, and Italy humming. Another theory of origin relates to a negative slave dispute. The term black sheep is considered to be a very negative statement. It relates to the idiom, the black sheep of a family, meaning the odd ones out. According to the Birmingham City Council of the Working Group Against Racism in Children's Resources, entitled an article, Nursery Rhyme Ban, on January 12, 2000, that stated, the nursery rhyme has colonial links to slavery. The lines, three bags full, refers to the three bags the slaves were told to get. And yes sir, yes sir, is the reply to the slave master. Now that you have been informed on the origins of Baba Black Sheep, we will now hear about Jack and Jill. The majority of nursery rhymes that we all know and love have mysterious and dark origins. Jack and Jill is no exception. The rhyme seems simple enough, as quoted from the book, Favorite Nursery Rhymes from Mother Goose. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. The rhyme is made up of quatrains and has a rhyming scheme of A, B, C, B. Typically, people only say the first verse, but some interpretations of Jack and Jill have up to 15 verses. The most common and well-believed origin of Jack and Jill comes from North Norse mythology. The story goes that siblings, Juki and Bill, 
were walking at night to go get water from the well to put into their bucket. As they were wandering, they came, upon, they came across the moon, who kidnapped them. In mythology from all parts of the world, the moon is portrayed as a thief who will take whatever he can get his hands on because he is lonely all by himself. The tumbling down and the broken crown would refer to the fight that would have happened between the children and the moon. Parents would tell this story to their children to warn them of the dangers that lurk in the night. They would look up into the sky, find the moon, point out the craters, and say that that is where Juki and Bill landed after being captured. Sabine Baron Gould, a pastor and well-known author of his time, was the first person to make the connection between Juki and Bill to Jack and Jill. He published his findings in his book, Curious Myths of the Middle Ages, in 1876. Over the years, Jack or Juki and Bill morphed into Jack and Jill. Jack first, and then came Jill for the alliteration. Digging deeper into the meaning of these words, we can find another meaning of Jack and Jill. Both Juki and Bill come from Norse verbs. Juki comes from Jaka, which means to build up, pile, or increase. And Bill comes from Billa, which means to be torn apart, fall down, or be diminished. Using these definitions of the words, we can place another meaning to how the moon's placement affects the tides. According to Kevin Crampton and Simon Potter, chairman for the Jack and Jill Windmill Society, in their article, The Nursery Rhyme, published in 2015, another origin of Jack and Jill can be attributed to the French Revolution. King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were not well liked by their people. They were the last king and queen of France, and they were married to form an alliance between France and England. The people did not like Louis because he tried to increase taxes multiple times, and they did not like Marie because she threw huge, expensive, and lavish parties, and often would disregard her people that were living in poverty and filth. They also did not like her because she had an affair with a very successful military general named Hans Axel von Bersen. He made plans to break them out after they were captured, but they could not escape because they were out of time. We can connect King Louis and Marie Antoinette to Jack and Jill because up the hill would refer to the steps up to the guillotine, the broken crown would refer to King Louis being beheaded by the guillotine, and Jill tumbling after alludes to Marie Antoinette who suffered the same death as her husband only nine months later. A popular activity for children to learn from this nursery rhyme is to fill up a bucket with water and have them throw stones into the water like it is a wishing well while they recite Jack and Jill. After hearing about two origins of Jack and Jill and a children's activity, we can now move on to Mary Mary Quentin Prairie. Almost everyone has heard the nursery rhyme Mary Mary Quentin Prairie, whether it was read to them as a child or if they have read it to children themselves. If you have not heard it, I'll read it to you now from the children's book, Mother Goose. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and, sil and pretty maids all in a row. This nursery rhyme originates from England and has been told to children for hundreds of years. For many years, the oldest known publication was by uh, Thomas Cooper and Tommy Thumb's Pretty Songbook, Volume 2. This is according to Jack Boone, a professor from Rutgers University, and a book he wrote called The Oxford Handbook of British Poetry, 1600 to 1800, published on October 20th, 2016. And over the years that people have read it, they have started to speculate what it actually meant, and in doing so, have created popular theories that reveal the dark history that is behind the seemingly innocent nursery rhyme. All the theories connect the Mary in the story to Mary Tudor of Queen of England long ago. Before I tell you about the main theories, I think it is important that you know a little bit about Queen Mary's rule. Queen Mary ruled from 1553 to 1558, and she had a large impact on England. She wanted to return England to the Catholic Church, and in doing so, she executed and tortured anyone who practiced a different religion. She even burned 300 people at the stake according to the British author Lewis Brenda in the British History Magazine published on June 5th, 2006. 
she executed um, common people as well as famous uh, Protestant leaders, one of which was John Rogers. John Rogers was responsible for publishing and printing Matthew, the Matthew Tyndale Bible, which was widely used in the Protestant religion. Now under the first theory. The first theory is about her torturing the Protestants, and it, it associates each of the flowers in the nursery rhyme with one of the many instruments of torture used by Queen Mary. And the last flower, the pretty maid, it also hints towards a tool used to execute the Protestants. This tool was called the Scottish Maiden, or what the people called maids. The Scottish Maiden was invented before the guillotine and is, was similar in purpose and design. The second major, um, the second major theory is about her, is still about Queen Mary, but is interpreted in an entirely different way. In, in this theory, that each of the flowers represent one of the major factors of Queen Mary's crusade to rid England of the Protestant religion. The first flower, the silver bells, stand for the Catholic cathedral bells, which Queen Mary wanted all of England to be filled with. The second flower, the cockle shells, referred to the pilgrimage to England. Whilst a large number of Protestants were executed, some were able to leave. Only the richest people were able to leave, usually. And the last flower, the pretty maid, refers to all the nuns in the Catholic Church. Finally, however, this has a dark history. Teachers have found a way to use it to teach children and have, have created a lesson plan for kindergartners that helps with memorization and word association. And in conclusion, we first talked about Humpty Dumpty, then Baba Ba Black Sheep, next Jack and Jill, and finally Mary Mary Quite Contrary. The origins of nursery rhymes are far more gruesome than they are made out to be by society. When thinking about nursery rhymes, it is very important to remember the words of Mem Fox. The fire of literacy is created by the emotional sparks between a child, a book, and the person reading.